Okay, we're streaming now, so we have two. Don't worry, they can't hear you. They can only hear. Oops, they can hear me. So I better. <laughs> yeah, hi everybody. We're going to have a very interesting discussion today. It's with the American Bald Eagle Foundation in uh, Haines. So thanks for joining in. Um, the audio should be working now. So I'm just going to look at the chat before we start. Make sure you can all hear me. Okay, very good. I thought they can hear me. Okay, that's excellent. I'm going to just switch my microphone off now. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another live show of Talented Talents 360. Today we have a very interesting session. We're going to go to Haines, Alaska. I've been fortunate I've been there before. It's an, quite an incredible place where you see lots of uh, eagles and they'll tell you much more about it. So our special guest is going to be Sydney. Thanks for joining in. And uh, it's the first time I'm actually not uh, um, broadcasting with any or talking to any guest that is east of me. Now we're going west of me. I've, I myself was on the Aleutians recently and uh, that is west of Hawaii. That is as far possible to see eagles as you can in Dutch Harbor. <laughs> so that's been, uh, that's been quite incredible. So uh, anyway, thank you, for, uh, thank you for joining. So here's our team that has helped. Thank you. This time special, uh, special thanks to Nicole because Nicole has introduced um, Sydney to the and uh, uh, persuaded her to come in live, which is fantastic. Suzanne, thank you, Jani and Donna Bella. So without further ado, I'm going to now switch live. And what you see there, that is Sydney Campbell. Sydney, welcome to our show and thank you so much for taking the time to join. Tell us thank a little. Thank you. It's, yeah. it's nice to be here. <laughs> You're very welcome. Well, tell us a little bit about what, what we're seeing there, who you are, and so on. Thank you. So my name is Sydney. I'm the Education and Development Director here at the American Bald Eagle Foundation. Um, that means I have a lot of different jobs, um, but mainly I develop all of our educational programming and I train the uh, Raptor ambassadors who live here to participate in those programs. So this is one of our ambassadors. His name is Hans and he's a Eurasian Eagle Owl and he is free flighted right now so he might choose to take off. There he goes. Sometimes he chooses to take off, but he's just going to go explore and he'll probably come back here in a couple minutes. 
Okay. But so we do a lot of education up here, and that education is focused not only on bald eagles, but also a lot of other raptors. It's funny, he's just sitting on a perch right above me. Ivy, you want to come back down? What do you think? Would you like to come back here? This is going to look pretty cool. <laughs> it's going to look pretty cool. Very nice. We'll wait. We have, we have a lot of time for raptors. Hey, Hans. Would you like to come down here? Maybe not. So all of the birds that we train here are trained using something called empowerment. We use the least invasive, most positive method of training that we are capable of. So all of the birds are positively reinforced for their participation. And they're not coerced into doing anything they don't want to do, which is why Hans is free flighted right now and exploring the room. Um, and which is why I'm not chasing him down and making him come back. I'll just ask him to come back. And if he wants to, he will. If he doesn't, that's fine. Right now he's distracted because there are quite a lot of new stimuli around. This is a new room for him. He hasn't been here in quite a while. Hey, bud. Yeah, Sydney, maybe something interesting about the uh, this Eura uh, Eurasian um, owl. Uh, uh, first, first of all, it's it's interesting again to to have the difference between a long-eared -eared owl and the Eurasian owl. And uh, I think another interesting question would be how did uh, how did this bird actually become part of the American Bald Eagle Foundation? Was it injured or what happened? Well, so many of the birds who live with us were brought to us um, after not necessarily recovering 100% successfully from injury. So some of our birds are permanently disabled, which prevents them from surviving in the wild. Hans, however, was actually um, bred to be an educator. So he came to us from a breeder who breeds these owls, both for falconry, which is really interesting with Eurasian eagle owls, and for education. Hi, would you like to come down here? <sighs> no, not really. All right. Well, here's a little bit of mouse if you want to. Or, here's a lot of bit of mouse. Yeah, Sydney was telling me earlier that um, Hans uh, likes uh, rabbit more than mouse. That's what I've learned, right? He does like rabbit a lot more than mouse. Mouse is not a super high value reward for him, so he's probably not super jazzed about it. Okay. I wonder if I can, like, point the camera up a little bit. So yeah, maybe if you can, we have time. Just take your time. <laughs> there he is. Oh, He's that's beautiful. Out, that's right. beautiful. There he is. <laughs> well, he can't be convinced at the moment. He's very happy. <laughs> he can be convinced. That's a really happy spot for him. So raptors really like to be up high because that's how they can kind of survey their territory and make sure there's nothing threatening them. Um, so Hans right now is in an unfamiliar spot and he likes to survey where he is. He's looking pretty comfortable. Like that's a pretty good spot. He has several other perches set up around the room as well, just in case he got uncomfortable and felt like he needed to go somewhere else. But yes. he'll come back eventually. In the meantime, yeah. In the meantime, can, can you anything yeah, in, you want? Yeah, introduce yourself a little bit, and then we'll jump to the uh, exciting topic, or the very not not exciting but uh, really alarming topic of lead poisoning. But before we go, tell us a little bit more about yourself and um, the function of the American Bald Eagle Foundation in Haines, and um, do you do any re rehabilitation and so on? Sure. So I um, started working with birds about three years ago. I actually started as an intern here at the American Bald Eagle Foundation. Um, I was an intern when I was studying at the University of Alaska Southeast, just south of here in Juneau. Um, so here at the American Bald Eagle Foundation, our mission is the preservation of the bald eagle and its habitat. Um, and we accomplish that through education and stewardship. Um, 
So we're not a rehab facility. We don't actually do any rehabilitation here. We do rescue and triage because there are sometimes birds in the local area that have been injured or are in trouble somehow. So we're often called to go out and catch those birds and bring them in and we'll stabilize them to the best of our ability. But there is no full-time vet here in Haines, and so we really don't have access to the medical equipment that we would need to be a successful rehab. So instead, we um, send them along to the Alaska Raptor Center in Sitka, where they do the rehab. Very good. And now the questions are pouring in already, which is wonderful. So let's start with question number sure, one fire away. <laughs> from Terry Green. Hi, Sydney. Beautiful owl. Does the American Bald Eagle Foundation have a breeding program? And which raptors um, do you allow to breed or are allowed to breed? Thank so you. we actually do not have a breeding program. Breeding programs are really large scale um, projects and we're just not equipped for it here. Haynes is a really small town. Um, and it, with bald eagles in particular, there are very few facilities in the United States that are permitted to breed them because they have come back from the brink of extinction so successfully and because they are so protected. It takes quite a lot of permitting to get uh, bald eagle propagation permission. So we don't do any breeding here, just education. Thank you. And that brings a second question from Carrie Miller. How many educational birds do you care for, Sydney? So we care for 10 birds here. We have three bald eagles, uh, two red-tailed hawks. We have our Eurasian eagle owl who is hanging out coolly above me. Uh, we have an eastern screech owl, and then we have a peregrine falcon, a lanner hybrid falcon, and a merlin. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's jump over to the topic now of lead poisoning. That is the topic sure. of the evening. and. Um, I just got a report in front of me from the University of Minnesota, the Raptor Center, and I just want to read the beginning out here. It says, for the past 40 years, lead, lead exposure and lead poisoning have been major health issues for bald eagles. Received by or admitted to our clinic, and now come the statistics which are really alarming. 90% of the bald eagles received each year, which is between about 120 to 130 for all types of problems, have elevated lead residues in their blood and of those 20 to 25 percent of these eagles have sufficiently high levels to cause clinical lead poisoning most of these birds die or are euthanized and so right. on and so on and then they say in the last 24 years alone there have over 500 eagles received or admitted to our clinic have either died or have been euthanized due to lead poisoning and i think that's enough to introduce the topic so maybe you can comment a bit uh, uh, about this and also your own thoughts. Thank you. Right. So lead is a really big problem in the United States. Um, and, you know, we've known for a long time that lead is damaging to humans. It's not something that we can ingest safely. It makes us really sick and can cause death. Um, but it's something that we haven't really kept up with the way we need to in order to protect wildlife. So... One of the main ways that wildlife is impacted by lead is through spent ammunition. Um, lead ammunition is kind of notorious for fragmenting when it's used. Um, so, for example, the Peregrine Fund con conducted a study um, where they basically went out and shot a bunch of white-tailed deers with uh, lead ammunition and then x-rayed them to see what percentage of deer had lead that had fragmented inside of them. And it's something over 90%. I mean... Basically, every time you're using lead ammunition, it's fragmenting and exploding into a million tiny little bits inside of the meat. And so, this is particularly uh, concerning for species that are scavengers, like bald eagles. Um, because, you know, when you go out and you hunt, you're not carrying the entire thing back, you're dressing it in the field and you're leaving behind that gut pile. And that gut pile is a really attractive source of food for something like a bald eagle. And so... Oftentimes that gut pile will be riddled with pieces of lead that the bald eagle will then ingest and become sick. Um, lead has a, it, it basically tricks the body into thinking that it's calcium. So it's metabolized as though it's calcium and stored in the bones and it's really ugly. Um, it's not, it's certainly not a quick or pleasant death. Um, causes things like ataxia, the birds, you know, stop being able to walk. It causes paralysis in the legs and the wings. Um, it causes neurological problems, so swelling in the brain that causes impaired vision and impaired balance, um, and then eventually leads to vomiting, seizure, or death. 
So it's, it's really unfortunate to see it happen. Um, but it does happen really frequently. Um, and bald eagles are not necessarily the only species that are impacted by it. Um, unfortunately, there's no nationwide repository where we're, count, where we're counting exactly how many bald eagles are, you know, suffering this fate every year. There are some states that are collecting information. University of Minnesota has an ongoing study for the last, you know, 30, 40 years. The state of Iowa is also doing similar studies. But we just, we don't have a count of how many because there are so many bald eagles in the United States. Yes, you have a count. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think you're absolutely right, and I think what is alarming, it's uh, you said, it's not only the bald eagle; it is right. also the, uh, the the condor, of course, in California yeah. that is uh, very much affected, and of course, a lot of waterfowl is affected, and so on and so on. And you know, uh, uh, Sydney, what surprises me? I was talking yeah, uh, last um, week to a Norwegian expert because they have a. Um, they, they they have eagles, of course, in um, in, in in Europe too, and um, we were asking the same question: Do they have any any problems there with uh, you know with lead poisoning on eagles? And he said yes. And what surprised me that even countries like uh, in in Scandinavia that are far more progressive and have better reasons, maybe because uh, because of gun laws and so on, that are much stricter there than the United States. Uh, to do something about it, but it seems like nobody in the world, no single country, has tackled this seriously, and that I find surprising. Yeah, so we have taken steps in the past to try and mitigate it, but they haven't been super effective. Um, in 1977, we, or maybe 1987, we outlawed uh, the use of lead ammunition in waterfowl hunting. You can't hunt ducks with lead ammunition. Um, but University of Minnesota, again, con conducted a study on that and found that it really didn't have a significant impact on bald eagle lead poisoning. We didn't, we didn't see a reduction in it. Um, so in 2012, actually, it was uh, lead ammunition was outlawed in national parks, which was a really good step, but unfortunately that was quickly repealed by the new administration. So we now no longer have lead protections in national parks. Right, and let's talk a bit about alternatives. I mean, there yeah. are alternatives. What what are they? Uh, what are the alternatives, and why are they not being introduced? Well, so the best alternative is to not use lead at all. Um, copper ammunition is what is recommended as an alternative, and the reason it's not really used is because it can be sort of cost prohibitive. Um, copper is much more expensive than lead, and so people are more inclined to use the lead. Um, you know, and I've, I've spoken with people that I know personally about why this is the case, why they aren't willing to switch. And, you know, I think it's important to have that perspective because I myself am not someone who goes out and hunts regularly. So I guess it's kind of a no brainer for me that we should be using copper ammunition. But as it turns out, you know, people need to go out and practice with guns, I guess. Um, you need to practice a lot before you're a good shot and they'll use the shin to practice. And if they were to switch to the copper ammunition when they were actually hunting, it, I guess, shoots differently than the lead. And so they would have to practice with the copper if they were to be reliably shooting with the copper, which is, you know, important. We want hunters to be ethical when they're hunting. And so, you know, you want to make sure that they're as skilled as possible. But that's, I think, the main reason is the cost prohibitiveness of copper. Yeah, and before the alternative the that I suggest to people if they're not willing to use copper is to remove or bury their gut pile. I know it can be kind of cumbersome to carry an entire dead animal out of wherever you find you find it and kill it, um, but that's really the best way to make sure that nothing is going to ingest it, and it has to be buried pretty deep for scavengers not to find it. Okay, now I find I see some interesting questions there on the chat, uh, and they're talking of, of, obviously of different metals. For the, you know, one question at Osprey Mama says, why can't we get the cost down? And the other question was, what about using steel as an alternative? And that, I mean, there are a lot of questions buried in this one question. The one is, of course, is copper that safe uh, to 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 animals? I mean, how much? Copper, uh, have there been any studies of, of, of the harm of copper or, or steel? Maybe you have a point of view on that. Right. So I don't know anything about steel. I'm really not, a, I don't know the difference between steel and lead, really. Um, so I don't know if steel would make an effective 
projectile. Um, I know that copper is safer because it doesn't fragment the same way that lead does. It has a tendency to kind of mushroom rather than exploding into little bits. Um, and it's also less toxic if it's ingested. You know, copper is something that it's not going to kill an, a scavenger the same way that lead does, which is why it's suggested as an alternative. As far as why it's more expensive, I don't know. I can't pretend to understand how the economy functions. <laughs> just oh, that's not... <laughs> Okay. Well, here comes question number three from Diana Lambertson. Have they found lead in eagles in the nest? Can they be pretreated with an antidote? So I know that bald eagles have certainly been found with lead um, during nesting seasons, and there's really not any preventative treatment. Um, lead poisoning can be treated if it's caught early enough with chelation therapy, which basically um, it's like a high calcium therapy, and it's it flushes the lead out of bone into the blood system where it can be filtered out by the kidneys. Um, but I, as far as I know, there's not really anything we can do prophylactically to prevent lead poisoning. Okay, very good. And um, question number four from Jackie Laughlin. So if lead ammo is used by some hunters and lead, fr lead fragments, aren't humans at risk of ingesting lead? That is the question. That's a great question. That's a great question. And the answer is they sure are. Um, again, the Peregrine Fund did a study about the use of lead ammunition, and they um, so they they visited, uh, I guess, professionally. How how would I describe that? Um, they tested ground venison from professional uh, factories where this was being processed, and um, you know when they tested it, they found that 34% of those packages of venison contained lead fragments. So that should be concerning. Um, and they also tested by feeding those lead, I guess, tainted packages of meat to pigs and found within two days that they were showing symptoms, that they were testing with blood, with lead in their blood. So pretty what? concerning. I myself wouldn't really be comfortable eating something that was... What about the statistics around Hanes? Is this a problem with lead? So unfortunately, I don't know. Um, there's not a ton of really good research about lead poisoning in the area, and there is no centralized kind of um, data repository in Alaska for people to report how often they're seeing cases of lead poisoning. I did reach out to a couple other facilities I haven't heard back yet, but I, I now I'm personally curious how many cases of lead poisoning they see every year. Um, but unfortunately, right now, we don't know. I do know that lead is the most popular type of ammunition. It's still... People don't really like to hear that they shouldn't use it. <laughs> right. I could just see a question here from Janet Adams. If we can't get rid of lead, are there any steps being taken to force the removal of leftover in kills? That's a great question, yes. That's a great question. And I haven't heard of anything along those lines. That's kind of interesting. And maybe we could like build volunteer course to go out and remove gut piles. Um, really right now, we're just trying to encourage hunters to take the re responsibility upon themselves to make sure that whatever they leave behind is safe for scavengers, which is definitely easier said than done. And, you know, just comparing different raptors with, with each other, um, we know that the, you know, the, uh, David Hancock just told me, you probably know David Hancock, he's just told me that in the Harrison um, area, uh, where we have lots of bald eagles, I think last week, and I don't have more statistics on it, there was a golden eagle and a bald eagle brought into OWL, that's our um, rehabilitation center uh, nearby, uh, and both have been, uh, it looks like, affected by lead poisoning, which is quite alarming because it was a very small, small area. And that brings me to another question. Um, are there any statistics that compare different raptors, or as you as you correctly said, scavengers to each other and which one seems to be affected most? You know, that's another good question that unfortunately I don't know the answer to exactly. There are a lot of studies on individual scavengers. Um, so bald eagles for sure are really heavily impacted by lead, but there's the owl talking to me. Golden eagles are also really heavily impacted by it, although less so I think than bald eagles. Um, Kind of the famous case that most people know about are the California condors, which are really, really seriously impacted by lead. Um, 
for people who don't know, uh, you know, several years ago when California condors were really, really endangered, there were only 22 individuals left of, in the wild. Um, and all 22 of those individuals were actually captured and put into a captive breeding program. Um, and there are now about 500 individuals and about half of those live in the wild. And the Peregrine Fund regularly captures and tests them and uh, around 50% of all California condor mortality is caused by lead poisoning. 50%, um, my goodness. 50%, yeah. Half of the condors that we are struggling to release back into the wild are dying because of lead. Well, um, that's... And it's really, it's not just raptors either. We have coyotes are pretty susceptible to ingesting lead. Uh, same thing with wolves. Really anything that scavenges small mammals are all impacted by it. Yeah, and that's, uh, here, here come a few uh, more questions. Let me just see. Ah, yeah, that's right. Here, Maxine Wirt is asking, Sydney, lead is used in so many ways. Don't you think that in that case, if possible, a deposit area for, there should be a deposit area for the waste? Well, that's, that's a tricky question. I'll let you answer that one. That is a tricky question because lead is also known to leach into the soil where it can become dangerous for um, kind of like subterranean animals and small mammals. It can make its way into plants, which are then consumed by other animals. Um, this is kind of a problem with lead sinkers that people use to fish. Um, you know, I'm sure we've all seen the dangers of fishing line that gets tangled in trees and left behind because they can't disentangle it. Um, and fishing line is its own problem that often entangles animals, but um, sometimes they leave behind those lead sinkers and they will leach into the soil, which can be dangerous. So if we were to have a, an area to deposit lead, I would worry about nearby, I guess, animals living subterranean. Well, I don't know. That's hard to say. I mean, lead is used in a lot of ways. And really, I think the best thing would be to just stop using it. <laughs> Well, abs absolutely. That brings us to the next question from Jackie Laughlin, which is a little bit related to that. Wouldn't burying the remains of the animals lead to lead getting into the groundwater? Yeah, so that is definitely a danger, which is why it's not the number one recommendation. Um, and really, it is, I, I'm not sure about groundwater, but it does leach into soil, which is again why we recommend that it's buried deep enough that no scavengers can access it and that it's not going to have an impact on some, you know, like earthworms and things like that, that other animals are eating. And um, yeah, Margaret59 is asking exactly about the condors. Isn't it that all condors, uh, uh, is all that condors eat scavenged? Is that right? Yeah, so condors are, um, you know, they're vultures, basically. They're, they're kind of raptors with an asterisk is what we call them, because vultures are really different from other raptors. Um, and one of the ways they're really different is that instead of using their really good eyesight or their really good hearing like other raptors do, they use their sense of smell. <laughs> Most raptors don't have a very good sense of smell, but condors sure do. And they smell the decaying detritus on the side of the road or wherever it may be. And that's how they find it. So they're almost exclusively scavengers. Yeah, that, that, would, that brings me for a quick additional uh, question of my own. Um, you know, we have a lot of turkey vultures uh, around here. I don't know how it is in Alaska and other areas, but our turkey vultures should then also be quite affected. They have very good uh, sense of smells, right? Definitely, yeah. Turkey vultures are some of my favorite birds in the world. Unfortunately, we don't have them here in Alaska, um, except for very, very rarely one, I think, maybe gets lost and ends up here. Um, but they're definitely impacted by the same thing. Um, turkey vultures are pretty susceptible also to vehicle strikes, unfortunately, because Roadkill is a pretty ready and accessible source of food for them, so they'll be eating on the side of the road and not get out of the way fast enough. Um, but lead is definitely known to impact them as well. They come in with lead poisoning not infrequently. Well, thank you for answering so succinctly. This is marvelous. So Kathy Newton comes with a question here. Has anyone found high levels of lead in fish from runoff from towns and city with lead pipes? Wow. <laughs> Ooh, with lead pipes, I don't know the answer to that. Gosh, I should become, you're, answer, you're asking so many questions that I should really know the answer to. Um, I know that lead has been found in fish, much in the same way that mercury is found in fish sometimes. They have a tendency to kind of pack on those heavy metals. Um, but I'm not sure if it can be, you know, attributed to lead pipes in any way, although, you know, that's definitely a thought. Um, I do know that one of those big, um, one of the big impacts, or causes of that is those lead sinkers that are 
used in fishing so often. And I love this next question from Maureen R. All, the, all these issues require political will. How do we progress in the present environment? Brilliant question. I think that the most important thing to do is to be kind and understanding and to give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, when we educate people about this, we find that they often had no idea that this was a problem or that they were contributing to it. I've never spoken with a hunter who has been taught that lead kills bald eagles and wasn't really remorseful and upset about it. Nobody sets out, well, some people do, but very few people set out to kill a bald eagle or a golden eagle or a California condor. So I, I think educating people as gently as we can and relating to them as best we can is one of the keys because really the people who are going to impact this movement are the people who are purchasing lead ammunition. So those well, are the people we need on our side. Yeah, and, um, and, and you know, you bring a very interesting point here. It's all, as you do uh, say about education. So my thoughts would be, I don't know how it is in the States, but I certainly know in Europe, uh, before you can go out as a hunter, uh, you know, with a rifle, you have to pass a certain exam. And they could put just the, you know, just making people or hunters aware of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the danger of lead poisoning to, especially to scavengers, wouldn't that be part of the education that, that would co I don't know how it is in the United States, but. Uh, <laughs> that would be, I think that would be great. Um, we do have, um, so all guns and ammunition in the United States are taxed. And part of that tax goes to a uh, fund, the Pittman, Pittman Robertson fund, which is then used um, for conservation projects and also for hunter education. Um, and that's kind of maintained by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So maybe seeing if there's anything we can do to introduce the concept of lead to that hunter education that's funded by this tax would be one step in the right direction. Right. And uh, question number 10 from MacLady. Can lead be passed on to the egg? That's a good question. And as far as I know, it can't. But I haven't seen any real scientific peer-reviewed studies to suggest that. Um, obviously, eggs are made of calcium and not entirely of calcium, but much of their composition is calcium. And lead kind of has this habit of tricking bodies into thinking it's calcium. My suspicion would be that birds who have significant lead poisoning are not laying eggs. Um, birds really don't lay eggs or reproduce or this is true of most wild animals, unless they're healthy, um, unless they feel like they have enough resources and they're in good enough shape. So female uh, raptors and birds will actually um, start to sequester calcium as they approach the breeding season. So they'll actually like light up on x-rays if you take them at the right time because their bones get really, really dense with calcium. And if they weren't able to sequester enough calcium, I doubt they would lay an egg. And sequestering calcium is something that happens when you're not lead poisoned. <laughs> so I, I don't imagine there's much risk of lead appearing in eggs. But again, I'm not the expert. I'm not a reproductive biologist. Thank you. Okay, and now comes question number 11. But I think these are very stimulating questions. I think they yeah, are really, these are great questions. Uh, I, I think they're brilliant. I wanted to thank all of you very quickly for you know, just keep on uh, putting in the questions. These are really brilliant questions. Uh, so we are learning a lot in the process. So question number 11 from Dana Steele. Can they not smell the lead with they? She, uh, let's, let's maybe talk about vultures. I mean, eagles don't have the, uh, uh, bald eagles at least don't have the sense of smells. Maybe, maybe, um, uh, vulturines do, but uh, I, I think bald eagles don't. So can they not smell the lead, at least some, some vultures maybe? I've never tried to smell lead myself. Um, I can't imagine it has too much of a smell, so I doubt that they can smell it. Um, and something that's important to remember is that, you know, there's a certain amount of evolutionary learning that would have to take place before smelling lead equaled danger. Um, and my suspicion is that they can't smell it because that learning may have, would have already taken place. You know, it's the same as we, um, we sometimes develop taste aversions to things that make us sick. Um, the same thing is true for wild animals. You know, that's, that's how we determine something is poisonous. If it tastes really bad, that's a way to let us know that it's not good for our body. Okay, um, so, now, he, now he's back. Can you, can, uh, can you introduce us a little bit about what's going on? He's there? back. Yeah, so this is Hans, and he's going to take off again, I think, in a second. Do you want this? Yeah, eat your mouse. So Hans is a 
Eurasian Eagle Owl. He's one of the ambassadors who works here with us. Down the hatch in one big bite. Um, and he's rejoined us. He got a tasty mouse out of it. Um, but Hans is uh, one of the educators who helps me teach people about raptors and why they're such an important part of our ecosystem. How long does, uh, the, uh, what's the life expectancy at least in, uh, you know, in when, when uh, not in the wild as, as you, uh, what's the life expectancy? That's a really good question that hasn't been studied very well. So in the wild, from what I have read, they can live into their 30s or 40s, um, similar to bald eagles. I have heard of instances, um, and obviously I can't confirm them, of uh, living in human care, Eurasian eagle owls living close to their, closer to their 60s. So Hans is five years old this year. Oh, he's, he's just so a young. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he's just a little guy. Uh, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, I mean, you know, personally, because my, my background is optics, I'm always interested in the incredible ability of their night vision. Is there anything you experienced with, uh, with this owl on night vision? Do you do any experiments? <laughs> he definitely sees better than I do in the dark. We do sometimes do programs at night, and I have kind of a hard time finding my way back to his aviary but he's like looking all around. He can see everything that's going on. Um, what I think is more impressive than his eyesight actually is his hearing. He can hear me coming from, I don't know, a really long way away. Um, and he can hear all kinds of things that I definitely cannot hear. He hears when cars are approaching long before I can see them. He can hear dogs barking really far away. He doesn't like dogs very much. Talking about dogs, could you compare the hearing of a dog to, to, to this owl? Is there any comparison? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, you know, dogs do have really excellent hearing and they are relying on that. But, um, you know, dogs are kind of more generalist as far as the senses that they're using. You know, they're using their sight, they're using their smell, they're also using their hearing. Um, whereas owls are focusing really, really hard, at least most owls are focusing really, really hard on their hearing. Um, so a lot of wild animals will do something called stimulus filtering, which is essentially why raptors don't have much of a sense of smell. It's because it's not very useful to them. Um, and so it's kind of, it would be overloading their brain with information if they had a sense of smell that would be distracting them from their other senses. So I can imagine, my guess would be that his sense of smell would be better than <laughs> um, a dog, or his sense of hearing would be better than a dog's, but I'm not certain. Right, and go on. If you have any more questions, just pour them in because I, I have loads, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to run the show here. It's more for our viewers too. But in the meantime, until some questions come in, uh, you know, just a little bit more about their night vision. Some something, and that's only a hypothesis at the moment. You know that a lot of the nest cameras are equipped with these night vision cameras, mm -hmm. and. Um, it, uh, it, it seemed to occur to, to me at least, and it's only a hypothesis, something we have to look at, into. Uh, of course, we know that bald eagles do not see the, um, you know, the, the far red or the, the near infrared of, of, of the spectrum of these, um, of these LEDs that they use. But I, it seems to, you know, there's not any literature, but there seems to be a suggestion that it's very possible that great horned owls do see that part. Um, and that could correlate to the frequent attacks that some of the bald eagles are experiencing at, uh, at, at nest sites, also, uh, you know, the juveniles as they grow up. So it's just, that's why I'm so interested in their, in their night vision, you know, so it's just a comment. Yeah, so I, I have heard that same rumor and, you know, considering that so many diurnal raptors can see into that UV spectrum, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I'm waiting to hear what studies make of it. I did hear a rumor that there was a study um, potentially being published sometime in these next couple of years. Um, and I'm kind of awaiting that with bated breath because I'd really like the answer to that question as well. Okay, here comes another question. How much, yeah, how much does it weigh? And oh, now comes the interesting question about the talent pressure. Well, the thing, I just have to say that as a physicist, if you talk about talent pressure, you will have to relate that to your finger pressure somehow, and then compare that to the owl pressure to get a sense of what talent pressure is about. Maybe you can comment on that, uh, Sydney. Yeah. So I always love asking people what they think Hans weighs, because I know he's really big. He looks super, super gigantic and heavy, but he only weighs about four and a half pounds. I like to remind people that birds have to fly, and he probably couldn't fly if he weighed 25 pounds, like some people like to guess. 
Um, and then as far as pressure, um, so I haven't measured his specifically, but you know, the average human can exert about 30 to 40 kilograms per square inch in, you know, kind of grip force. Um, great horned owls are closer to like a hundred. Um, and I imagine being so closely related to great horned owls, these guys are going to be pretty similar. It's definitely significant. He, he, you know, he's, if he were wild, he'd be hunting with his feet. And so he's got to have that really strong grip to be able to crush whatever it is he was picking up. Yeah, and of course, the interesting here is another question from Kathy Newton. Do you take the owl out to hunt like a falconer would do? We don't take him out to hunt. He's actually never learned to hunt. So Hans was bred to work as an educator, which means that he's lived with humans his whole life. He's never lived anywhere else. Um, and so he never learned how to hunt. He also sometimes makes this little baby sound that you may have heard earlier because he never learned that that sound would scare his food away because it doesn't scare his food away because his food comes out of my hand. Very good. So, yeah, we don't do any falconry training. None of the birds are trained to hunt here. Some of the birds who were previously wild may remember how to, but we find that cutting their diets up into nice little pieces um, makes it really uh, easy for us to reinforce them for the behaviors that we ask for. Right. And Nicole now has a question. Can owls swim? Can they swim? The answer is yes, but not well. Um, so these guys, in fact, are known to sometimes hunt small fish and amphibians, um, but they don't want to end up in the water. Same thing as bald eagles, they'll kind of skim the surface of the water, um, because really very few raptors are evolved sufficiently to submerge and then re-emerge from the water. Really, osprey um, are the best built for that. They can, you know, fully submerge in the water and then pull themselves out. They've got those big, long wings for that. Um, these guys can do kind of like an awkward breaststroke, much like bald eagles can. Um, but if they spend too much time in the water, they can get waterlogged. If that gets into their down feathers, which can make them heavy and drown or which can make them really cold. So they don't, they don't want to spend time in the water. They do bathe in the water, um, but in shallow water. Yeah, and there's an interesting question here from Diana Lambertson. Are female owls larger than males like other raptors? Yes, definitely. Um, so Eurasian eagle owls are arguably one of the largest species of owl in the world. Hans here weighs about four and a half pounds, and he's roughly 50% of the size that a large female would be. So large females are known to weigh up to nine pounds, which to give you some perspective, we have three bald eagles here, and the lightest one weighs 10 pounds. So imagine an owl that's roughly bald eagle sized. Incredible. Yeah. And here comes Maxime Wirt with another question. How many pounds of prey can Hans handle? <laughs> can he handle? Uh, probably he could handle a lot. Actually, we keep our birds pretty, like we keep them at ad lib weight, which means that, um, you know, we don't do any weight reduction to, I guess, force them to participate in their training. He stays at a pretty comfortable weight. Um, so he eats, let's see, 125 grams, or he eats about 100 grams a day, which is just shy of a quarter of a pound. Um, so he eats about a quarter of a pound every day, which brings us to, what does that mean you eat? Like, he eats just over a pound, a ha pound and a half, I guess, every week. Right, and I can see a question here from Diana Lambertson. Is it true owls only eat the head of larger prey? Oh, definitely not. He will eat the whole thing. Um, it, I guess it depends on how large the prey is, but, you know, raptors are notorious for eating the entire thing. Um, brain cases are definitely very uh, nutritious. You've got some really good stuff up in the head. You've got, obviously, brains. You've got eyeballs. You've got bone and fur and all kinds of good stuff. Um, but they will definitely eat the entire thing. I guess it depends on how much they can carry away as well. And yeah, I'll, I'll throw in a quick question because this always interests me on, um, you know, on, on uh, when falconers uh, feed, you know, feed their raptors. I know that they get quite lazy after they've eaten something. They, 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 <laughs> how, how is it with the owl? Um, so, you know, we find at the end of his training session that he's sated, that he feels pretty good and he's going to go like rest up high and maybe take a nap. Um, but, you know, these are all really hard workers. These guys know um, exactly what we ask of them, and, and they work really hard to earn their 
dinner every day. Um, and we work really hard to build these trusting relationships with them so that they know that their dinner is always going to come when they do what we ask them to do. So Hans knows that anytime I ask him to do something really hard, like sit here on a perch when he's bored, he's always going to get a treat. And okay. he can always fly away if he wants to. Like he's Okay, now here comes a question, like as if this, uh, I have to laugh a little bit, but I love this question from Kathy Newton. Do you train them to poop in one area since they, they are able to fly around <laughs> everywhere? We don't. Um, so birds have a habit of oh, evacuating before they fly away. Uh, so remember I mentioned that birds always need to be light to be able to fly. Um, and so a lot of times we'll see that like when we walk in to start a training session, they'll go ahead and poop because they know they have to fly down in a second. Um, but raptors are not neat. It's definitely messy work caring for them. Um, we do a lot of aviary cleaning. Thank God for interns. Um, <laughs> because they kind of just indiscriminately poop all over their enclosure. It's easier with owls because they poop straight down. Bald eagles kind of shoot it backwards. And a question that I'm going to throw another question that always interests me relates more to the learning ability. I can't say intelligence because intelligence is very difficult to measure, but the learning ability of different raptors. Can you comment on owls, eagles, and so on? You know, um, maybe you've you know, just how they behave and how quickly they are able to learn or willing to learn? So I think it depends a lot on the way that you train them. Um, I found that they learn really quickly when you're clear with them what the criteria are for the reward. So, um, you know, we do something called operant conditioning or operant learning, and basically we capture a behavior, and the moment they do it, they get a reward. And they know, oh, cool, that worked. Maybe I'll try doing that again. Um, and so they're, they're capable of learning new behaviors really quickly. Um, Hans recently learned to catch a ball. Um, I don't know between species if there's necessarily any generalized speed. It's kind of a study of one when you're training any animal. So you can generalize and say, well, bald eagles are really neurotic and they're hard to train. But that's definitely not going to be true across the board. Um, so I, I think it's more of an individual thing. I've never trained any other Eurasian eagle owls, but Hans is pretty mellow. Good. And Kathy Adams is asking, do you dissect the pellets from all the raptors there as part of the education programs? Uh, we get a lot of pellets because raptors are going to cough up a pellet every day. So 10 pellets every day means, you know, several thousand pellets every year. Um, but we do save some of them and we do... Um, dissect them after they're sterilized with, um, I actually te teach a youth class. We're actually dissecting owl pellets tomorrow and we'll be using some of his pellets. Very good. So you do. And that's, well, that was a good question here. One from Di Diana Lambertson. How far can an owl turn his head? <laughs> Ooh, so owls are famous for it. They can turn their heads about 280 degrees. Um, and this is actually true of all raptors. I think owls are famous for it because they kind of like, they're super puffy right here and they don't have much of a neck. Um, but they can turn their heads 270 degrees because they have twice as many cervical vertebrae um, than we do. So we have seven vertebrae in their necks and they have, gives them that good range of motion, which is really important because they cannot move their eyes from side to side the same way we can. So if they want to look at something that's off to this side, they have to turn their head. Interesting. And life flight one, do raptors still exhibit instinctual behaviors when hand raised? They do. Um, and, and that's kind of an interesting question. And it's something that's discussed a lot in raptor training. So um, birds who are imprints like Hans's, um, that means that they um, were raised by a different species and have... Um, imprinted on them, so he identifies with us as his own species. Um, birds who are imprinted do definitely um, display behaviors that are sort of unusual for wild owls. So Hans, for example, you may have heard him earlier making his little eeping sound. That's a sound that they make in the nest to let their parents know that they're hungry. And then when they go off on their own as adults, they learn that if they make noise, they scare away their prey, so they stop making it. Um, but they do definitely have you know, many behaviors that are just coded in their DNA. You know, they, we didn't have to teach him to fly or to grasp things or to eat. He, you know, a lot of this stuff, the, the body language is all just coded in them. 
And here's an interesting question from Wobbies, where I, I think I know the answer, but I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. The eagle owl is found in Russia. Are they found on the Aleutian Islands? Which is quite a good question, because you have the Aleutian Islands uh, uh, stretching all the way to Kamchatka. I think this is where the question is coming from. Right. So as far as I know, their range does not stretch that far um, to the east. You know, they're really more found in western Russia and um, Europe. So... I doubt that you would see them that far east. It would be really interesting if you did. Um, we do sometimes in the Aleutian Islands see stellar sea eagles, which kind of make their way over from Siberia, so Kamchatka area, which would be be really interesting to see a Eurasian eagle owl make its way that far east, though. And here's a question. Maybe we've answered this before. What? Why is Heinz at the center? <laughs> So Hans lives here to work as an educator. Um, he was bred to work as an educator, and he came and joined our team about five years ago. And he's a really charismatic individual who hangs out with me all the time and does educational programs. So stuff like this. His job is to hang around and let people see how awesome and charismatic he is so that people in turn will think, man, maybe I can do something to protect owls. Something we talk about a lot with Hans in programs is rodenticide poisoning. Um, Eurasian eagle owls are really susceptible to rodenticide poisoning because they eat a lot of small mammals. So something that people don't often know about rodenticides is that it doesn't just kill the mouse, it kills anything that might eat the mouse. And often what's eating that mouse is an owl or a hawk or a coyote, something along those lines. Um, and it can be a real problem. It's, you know, I, I kind of put it up there with lead as far as a danger to raptors and other wildlife. Okay, and now the questions are pouring in again, Sydney. Of so course. Here, we, here we go. Carrie Mill is asking, how do you sterilize the pellets? It would be better than using gloves every time and making waste. Interesting question. Uh, we sterilize them in what is essentially um, a, an autoclave. It's, it's used to sterilize um, medical equipment, um, but we, you can also do it in like a, I guess like a rice cooker, I think is something that other people use. But it's really just steam heat. You know, they, we just get them really hot to sterilize them. Okay, and Diana Lambertson, at what age are owls sexually mature? So that varies by species of owl for sure. Um, Hans is, as far as we know, reaching sexual maturity um, within this last year. He started kind of flirting with us a lot when we walk out into the aviaries in the morning and the evening. Um, from what I've read about Eurasian eagle owls, it's typically between two and five years. So Hans is five years old this year, and he does a lot of hooting and tail lifting at us. Again, because he's an imprint, and he thinks that he's a human. He's going to impress you. <laughs> yes. But there's another one of those in instincts that hangs on, even though he was re reared by humans. Um, he definitely knows how to flirt with the ladies. Ah, that is wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. Okay, next question. Kathy Adams, do all owls have one ear hole higher than the others to hear better? I didn't even know that. Yeah, so um, owls that use their ears to hunt have one up here and one down here. And the one that's on top is also farther forward than the one that's on the bottom. And they have those asymmetrical ears so that they can triangulate the location of whatever it is they're hearing. You know, they know that if it hits this ear first, that it might be a little bit in front of them and maybe off to their right. Whereas if it hits this ear first, it might be behind them or off to their left. Um, but that's not necessarily true. So that's not as pronounced in um, diurnal owls. There are a few species of owls that are active during the day. Um, Northern hawk owls are a good example. They're called hawk owls because they kind of look like hawks. Are you going to take off again? Um, <laughs> And, and they look like hawks because they're using their eyesight to hunt rather than their sense of hearing. Okay, thank you. My goodness, they're just pouring in, so I'm trying to catch up here. Margaret59, sure. this is a difficult one, I will have no clue. Uh, is there a species difference between a Eurasian eagle owl and a Blackiston fish owl? Um, yes, if that is the species I'm thinking of. So the fish owls are in the same genus. Uh, so he's, his Latin name is Bubo Bubo. These are Bubo owls. They're closely related to great horned owls, which we have here in North America, Bubo, Bubo virginianus. Um, and I'm not sure of the species name of the fish eagles, but they are the same genus. So they are closely related. Yeah, At least as far as I know. Taxonomy cool. is also not my profession. 
Thank you, Alatrak. Um, so, Sydney, what is the lifespan of the owls? That again varies really quite a lot between species. I actually learned today that the oldest uh, recorded boreal owl in the wild was only three years old. Um, so, typically, the rule of thumb is that the smaller the species, the shorter the lifespan, and then those larger animals you're seeing living for a longer time. So, these guys can live, you know, into their 30s or 40s in the wild, although not super common, um, just because there's so much potential for starvation or injury, but it really, really diverse life, lifespans for owls. Well, Sydney, is amazing to see the interest here. We're at question number 27, in case you lost track. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. It's wonderful. From KMS Ban R, uh, how long do, do their parents provide food for them? Do they spend time teaching them how to hunt? Yeah, so definitely wild parents are going to be providing food for the first couple weeks um, of, a, of an owl's life and then teaching them how to hunt mostly by example. So with Eurasian eagle owls, I don't know the exact amount of time that they're spending in the nest, but I doubt it's more than like 90 to 100 days after they hatch. Um, and then when they fledge, you'll often see um, owls like this kind of hanging off of branches and watching their parents and figuring out how to hunt. And sometimes you see them on the ground because they didn't do a very good job of flying away the first time. But they learn pretty quick. They have to learn pretty quick or they won't survive. And Terry Green is asking, uh, does he have a love mate and how do they behave? By the way, he says, nice art on the wall. Oh, thank you. Um, Hans does not have a mate. Uh, he, we don't have any other Eurasian eagle owls. Hans's girlfriend is really, uh, you know, it varies by day, but one of his trainers is usually the object of his affections. He flirts with us quite a lot. Wonderful. Gosh, we've, ca we've caught up now. So I'm going to take another one or two um, questions, if there are any more, because then we're slowly going to round it up. I think we have stretched the American Bald Eagle Foundation quite a long time. So here's another question number 30 from Diana Lambertson. How do the owls get to mice under the frozen ground? Wow, what a question. Uh, so those northern species of owls are really good at just dropping down and driving through the snow. Um, great gray owls are famous for being able to hear mice under as much as three feet of snow and to pinpoint their location so exactly without ever seeing them that they can just dive feet first into the snow exactly where they know that mouse is and fly, fly off with it. So it's really that sense of hearing that's going to be helping them locate those mice. Very good. Okay, I think, uh, let me see if there's any other question that I can spot at the moment. So they've, gave them, they've uh, given links for you. I can see that as wonderful. Uh, so our, uh, I just want to quickly blend in the, uh, let's see, oh, I'll do that at the end. But I'll blend that at the end. So I, um, anyway, Sydney, I would like to thank you for the time and the dedication that you have. It's wonderful to see young people like you. I know, <laughs> really I do, I think it's wonderful that are so engaged with animals and, uh, you know, teach, uh, you know, do such valuable time in teaching. I'm just curious because, you know, Haynes is so isolated, as you correctly said, and I also found out. Um, who then, when do you get most of your visitors? We definitely get most of our visitors in the summer. We are a very cruise ship driven town. So cruise ships visit us throughout the summer. We actually have our first one coming in like three weeks. Um, and then it gets pretty quiet in the winter. We are, we are accessible by the road system. You can drive to Canada from here, but more often people are accessing Haynes either flying in or by taking a boat. Are you gonna fall off? <laughs> and, and finally, that's a great question from Nicole. How can people help the American Bald Eagle Foundation? Well, we are a nonprofit, so we are mostly member funded and, and donation funded. So we always appreciate people who are willing to donate anything. No donation is too small for us to make a difference. You know, I think it often surprises people how expensive it is to run a, a, an operation like ours, you know, everything from sponges and cleaning supplies to food for these guys, which can get very costly. It costs us about $20,000 every year just to keep the birds. Um, so anyone, you know, if they're interested in helping us, they can donate. 
We also have a really big project going on that we're really excited about right now. We're going to get started here in a couple weeks as soon as it thaws. Um, we are building new aviaries. We're building new homes for this guy and a couple other birds. Um, and this is kind of part one of a longer term prog project where we will eventually rebuild all the aviaries, I hope. Um, but we're going to get them bigger spaces with more light and, and better landscaping and more options so that they can feel as comfortable as possible in their space. So we do have a GoFundMe and I think you guys have the link for that. And if people are interested in contributing to new houses for birds like Hans and for our bald eagles, that's always very much appreciated by us. There you go. And uh, of course, finally, the, the question, I was also very close when I was there in Haines. I think November you have the Bald Eagle Festival, right? Yeah. So Haines is famous for um, one of the largest congregations of bald eagles in the world. Um, in November, we have a really special area right here on the Chilkat River. The confluence of the Chilkat and Tsirku Rivers um, doesn't freeze as early as the other rivers in the area. And so a late run of salmon is accessible because there's no ice over the river. So bald eagles come from all over Alaska, Yukon Territory, British Columbia, even as far south as Washington and maybe Oregon to access that spawned out salmon. It's a huge smorgasbord we have between two and 4,000 bald eagles on the river. Very nice. Well, thank you, uh, Sydney. I'll, I would really like to thank you from all my heart for uh, coming on the show. It's really wonderful to have this education. People really appreciate it. And it's, well, thank you so much. Uh, this was really fun. It was really <laughs> nice to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, that's, it's been so much fun. So you, you, uh, you can listen on the background. I will just, uh, you know, I'll switch over now. So thanks again for this beautiful, to see Hans there performing just before. So um, we'll say goodbye and I'll just switch over. Thank you. Alrighty. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's, I, th I think it was a marvelous, uh, a, a, a really a marvelous interview with Sydney. And I would like to thank you a lot for all those incredible questions. They were really, really good questions. So intelligent. Uh, so, uh, you know, on that note, I just want to uh, give the end card here. So hope that everyone, this is, I mean, look at the beautiful decoration here from, <laughs> I think it was Nicole here. So thank you for everybody to take the time in spite of, uh, you know, being so close to Easter. We understand that. So ho hope everybody has an exciting week. And don't forget, yeah, to like, give us thumbs up, please. I think that was a lot of effort from especially from the, um, uh, from the Haynes uh, uh, American Bald Eagle Foundation, who put so much effort into that. You know, this is all done voluntary. Don't forget that. So please give us thumbs up and recommend us to others. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. That's what, and I would like to thank uh, those generous donations that I just uh, have seen. I already put it in the chat. Thank you so much for, for, for keeping the channel alive. And, um, you know, just uh, a, a a quick note right at the end if you haven't looked at patreon it's it's quite incredible uh, just look at the the gift structure there it starts at two dollars uh, you know i do keep my promises and those people who, who are patreon they're more than 40 now can see that the reward structure is really wonderful so you uh, it goes all the way up uh, you know seeing some unlisted uh, videos behind the scenes and so on so I go, it really goes through all the, um, the different stages. So at least have a look at it. I think you'll like it. I just wanted to say I'm off to Australia on Thursday next, uh, next week. So that means uh, that on Friday, um, let me just turn off the green screen there one second. I don't, uh, it's, not, it's not working very well. Just hang on, I'm just, uh, I don't like the chroma key here. Okay, so I'm just going to pull this down because I don't like that. One sec. There we go. That's better. I think that's... Uh, now, now the camera's not focused anymore. It doesn't know what it to do. But I think that's a bit better. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you very much for, for joining. I'm off to Australia on Thursday and I will try and do some, some live broadcast from Australia if I can. I'm going to a very lonely part. I do the other part which is astrophotography and education there. But they, are, they have some beautiful wedgetail eagles in Australia. And I hope that um, you know, I'll do some live broadcasts. I cannot predict exactly when we have a lot of time difference and so on. 
but I think it would be more or less around the time that, that, uh, that they are now, simply because that is morning in Australia already on the next day. Okay, somewhere around there, I think they're changing to winter time again in Australia right now. So, oh, thank you, Osprey Mama, by the way, for a very generous donation. <laughs> thank you, Osprey Mama. Well, you've all been really generous and very helpful. I wanted to thank you from really from, from the bottom of my heart. And thanks for taking such interest in, in these wonderful raptors. And, uh, you know, let's continue. I'd, I'd like to get a live guest wherever possible. So my next, next broadcast, uh, by the way, I also wanted to say uh, on Wednesday, we'll have one more news uh, broadcast. So the news broadcasts are going to be on 5 p.m., um, uh, Pacific time, which is 8 p.m. Eastern time. It's going to be about 30 minutes. So we're going to um, aggregate all the news into one week. It's e uh, one day of the week, which is going to be Wednesday. And then Thursday, I'm flying to, to Australia. Friday, I basically don't exist because Friday you're in the air and I'm landing there locally on Saturday. <laughs> it's a long trip to Australia. But I will definitely let, uh, you know, you'll hear from me for sure. And, uh, you know, this is what makes life so exciting to go to different parts of the world and to be able to come with new inspiration and give you some value, which hopefully is something that inspires you and, you know, gives you also inspiring questions. So I just wanted to thank you for all that. Wish you a wonderful, happy Easter. And, uh, you, know, you know, thanks for, for keeping the channel going. Happy Easter.